Welcome to this introductory series of training videos for SolidCam. This video's topic is the Turbo HSR operation. So Turbo HSR is a next step above the original HSR operation that we've covered previously in this introductory series. It's uh, so-called because it actually can calculate a little faster than the HSR so far. Uh, and the Turbo HSR has more details to further refine those rules that you're adding to your roughing strategy. So overall, it is still a 3D model recognition roughing toolpath, but it has a few extra details that the original HSR does not have. So let's take a look at that toolpath. So first, to get that toolpath, you can just right-click anywhere in your operations tree, Go to add milling operation, and you can see that it says Turbo 3D HSR. So it's distinguished from the original HSR, but it's in the same uh, section of the menu. So let's take a look at the actual toolpath itself. There are actually three technologies in the upper left corner. THSR hatch, THSR contour, and THSR rest. So essentially, the contour and the rest terminology is the same as what we found throughout our 3D roughing toolpaths and some of our pocketing toolpaths. Hatch, contour, essentially just a zigzag across the part. Contour is offsetting from the edges and uh, doing almost like a racetrack style toolpath. And then rest always refers to the machining of the remaining stock. So in that case, once we get to that technology, you'll see that you can tell it what the previous tool size was, what the current tool size is, and then it'll machine only the difference of what was left behind. So let's start with THSR hatch. So the geometry in a, H, a turbo HSR toolpath is still the target. Now you do have the option of selecting other models on your file. Uh, really all you're doing here is you're telling it what you want this part to look like at the end of this toolpath. So really the machining surfaces is still just the solid, although you have the ability to select whatever you like. You can just click on new geometry, and then click on whatever solid on screen, whether it be a combination of solids or your actual original target, you have that ability. But what's new in the geometry section for a toolpath of this type is this lower section, surfaces and offsets. I am adding a offset, a global offset to the entire target, although I could switch this to axial and radial, and then basically just tell it that I don't. Not only would I like to add a offset on all surfaces, but maybe just in the axial and the radial direction axial and radial basically just vertical and horizontal. But let's put this back to global. I also have the ability here to give it additional offsets. So let's say on this part, I don't only want to just leave 20 thou on all faces, but I can go and I can add some pre-selected geometry or I can just go to select and we'll add individual faces. So let's say these particular faces here are somehow critical. So I want to make sure that I leave maybe more material on those faces. So by selecting those individual faces, I'm adding that to my offset directory here. So not only on the overall part am I leaving the 20 thou, but on these individual faces, I'd like to leave maybe 30 thou. So on those individual faces, I can say, leave some more material there. Or maybe those faces, I want to rough out a little more in this one operation. I can reduce it even more. So I have individual control over the offsets on each face, or in this case, each solid as well, if I wish. Um, so this could really help with the roughing out of a part where there's different faces that need different finishings, different, uh, different offsets for different reasons. You can really dial it in using this option here. Under stock, this is still a 3D recognition toolpath. So it's gonna to look at the stock in any way that you choose. Now in this section, we can actually give it some real detail as how we would like to look at the, stock, at the solid. Uh, so if I do not check the box that says respect stock model, it essentially will just start from my original stock definition, the one that I defined when I first opened up this CAM part. That definition and how to define that, that stock definition was covered in the getting started with a milling CAM part video earlier in this introductory series. So I refer you to that on that particular definition. But once you're at this point, you're using either that default definition, or you can say respect stock model, which essentially is the same as adding that stock recognition. And now I can get it to look at the updated stock. So the resultant stock of all my, uh, all my preceding toolpaths, um, or I can tell it to only look at specific surfaces, so I can turn on surfaces and then click on the stock surfaces. And what this is actually doing is allowing you to add a little bit of material on just those surfaces and only machine just those surfaces. So again, really details 
where the material is rather than just looking at the updated stock and probably giving it some boundary conditions or anything like that. If I go to 2D boundary, this basically is my uh, ability here to give it some additional uh, geometry to define just a, a 2D extrusion boundary, basically. It's just really just telling it, in this area, I'd like to just machine this amount of material. Uh, it's almost like the uh, prismatic version of, the, of that boundary is used as the stock. And then lastly is bounding box. So uh, if you didn't already define the stock in the beginning of the CAM part file, you have the ability here to do a bounding box around our part. And again, we have the ability to shrink or expand essentially a positive negative offset off that face. And what this can really do is help you with um, castings or forgings. So rather than going just off the updated stock, if I didn't have a STL defined as my casting or forging, I could choose those individual surfaces and then add a little bit of material on those surfaces to represent a casting or a forging. Now, while we're here, you can see that there are some options here called stock has undercuts and use part silhouette. Um, so what you're doing with the stock has undercuts is maybe this updated stock or whatever other definition you use here where this option pops up, it allows you to tell SolidCam that even though it does have some material on this top half here, between there is an undercut. So don't generate any passes there uh, in your toolpath. Because this is a 3D roughing strategy, I'm giving it some step down and step over. And I don't really ne need it to do the step over and step down in this area. It's an undercut. So basically check that box, tells it to take a look at the updated stock to see where the material is and where it isn't. Use part silhouette essentially just takes the outside edges of the part and then just projects it down. So it's almost like giving it just another kind of constraint boundary around that updated stock. Let's turn this guy off and we'll use the original stock. And then the lower half uses the same sort of uh, controls as you normally would find in a constraint boundary section. Essentially, we're telling it to look at a certain piece of stock and only in a certain area. So again, very much the same as what we've seen with the use 2D boundary options in other toolpaths. Fixtures. This gives me the ability to add multiple surfaces or even solids to define something else to, uh, to gouge check against. Now it's called fixtures, but you can select other solids in here as well. All you're really doing is saying, keep a certain offset away from whatever solid I've selected here. In this case, I have my vice selected here. So I'm actually doing some gouge checking against that vice. And under pre-drilled holes, this gives you the ability, like we've seen in previous toolpaths, uh, namely the pocketing toolpath, to define a pre-drilled hole. So now, if you have any kind of ramping strategy, it can look at this pre-drilled hole as a, as a pilot hole. Uh, this is just really the ability to give this toolpath something to recognize in terms of a start point. Under tool, we are still looking at using milling tools here. For more on how to add a milling tool to your toolpath, I would refer you to the Create Milling Tool uh, operation video in this introductory series. What we see here that's a little more unique is the fact that we have dynamic holder checking. We can actually check the holder against the final machine surfaces, as you see in the bottom left corner, or we can check it against the uh, in-process stock, meaning that if we didn't mill all this out, it's actually gout checking against that rather than just the final solids. So you have the option to check between those two. Data, as always, is where you plug in your feeds and speeds. And we actually have some feed control here in this operation as well. So you can actually uh, dictate feed control zones inside your part file using sketch geometry. Under levels, very similar to what we've seen in other 3D toolpaths. Essentially, this toolpath is gonna recognize from the stock and the target what material needs to be removed, and it's just gonna travel in uh, uh, particular Z direction, tool direction to achieve that. But if I need to clear the part in any way, I can tell which clear areas I like to go to. By default, it's the Z direction, but you can choose any axis you like. This is very similar to what we see in the HSS toolpath. For more on this particular section, I'm referring to the HSS full video in the introductory series. Constraint boundaries. This section here is actually just controlling the movement of the tool in the XY plane. The majority of the parameters in this one section are covered in a playlist on our YouTube channel referring, referred to as the HSM boundary type playlist, referring to that video for those details in terms of creating automatically and created manually. But unique to the Turbo series of, the, of uh, Toolpath is the create automatically 3D boundaries. And this one is very simple. 
what you're looking at in the bottom left corner is representation of tool contact. So it'll generate a constraint boundary based off of the tool that I selected and the contact point with that stock and that target. So you can see that the constraint boundary will be widened if this ball mill can touch that corner right there. So it actually just allows it to wander outside the part, still staying within a certain constraint boundary based off of the tool contact point. But if I want to just do it by part silhouette, the tool stays completely inside the part silhouette, the outside edges, the outside shadow of the part, only by the center of the tool, as represented by that graphic. Or we can do part and height, meaning that it'll expand the constraint boundary to the radius of the tool. So now the tool can do the entire part uh, while still in contact. So again, a very quick way to define the, uh, the constraint boundaries for your part file. But I'm just going to switch this back to create it automatically, and we use the default options. Under passes, this is where we'll give it those roughing rules for this roughing toolpath. So I have step down and I have step over, which can also be defined not only just by a step down value, by number of slices, and step over by percentage of the tool diameter. So we have similar options we've seen in other toolpaths inside SolidCamp. In terms of levels, we're recognizing the stock and target in this toolpath, so we can use that for our limits as well. So if we set it to automatic, it'll automatically determine the Z travel limits either by the stock, the target, or both. If I switch this to user defined, then we get similar controls what we've seen in the HSR video, uh, where we can just do it by target, by stock, or manually enter those in there. But I'm gonna use the automatic stock and target. Go to sorting, and here you actually tell it how you like to travel around the part. So in this particular strategy, we're using hatch, so I'm telling it to do a cutting method of one way, although I could tell it to do a zigzag. I have Direction one, direction two, essentially climber conventional. And machine by, we've seen this in the HSS video where we tell it to either do it by lanes or regions, meaning that either we just continue the tool path no matter where, uh, where we are on the part. So in the case of, case of hatch, if I'm going across the part and I want to continue that line, I'll jump around this part and continue that line across there. Or I could do regions where it will continue that line only as far as this section here, and then just do what it can in this section, and then eventually jump over to the other side of that boss, and then continue the hatch on that side. So this could uh, lead to a cleaner toolpath where the tool does not jump around as much. And then those intermediate slices that we're about to talk about in the adaptive step down, we can actually get it to be done after the last step or during, after each depth. Speaking of adaptive step down, additional steps, this is uh, basically your control over what happens if there are any features on this 3D model that fall in between those steps that we told it in the passive section. So in this case, I gave it a 250 step down, a quarter of an inch step down. So I'm going to tell it that if there are any features that fall in between that 250 thou step down, to add a constant step down on those faces of just 25 thou. So you're going to see a lot of scalloping on the part where that, um, that step down has, uh, has fallen away. Smoothing and point distribution, those are similar to what we saw in the HSR video, so I refer you to that video for the details of this section here. Tool control, you do not see the tool control act in this particular toolpath. This section will be expanded when you take a look at the five axis toolpath video also on our YouTube channel. In the link section, we have expanded control over the ramping parameters in this particular toolpath. So you can see that we actually have a priority list that you can build here. So rather than just telling it to do one type of ramping, you can actually tell it to try one, and if that one doesn't work too well, you can use the other ones in order here. Now this is just the default one, but I can always change the order that these guys pop in. Approach slash retract, very similar to what we saw in the HSS video. You can control where this will approach and retract from, and then in terms of links, how to link those particular areas between slices and regions and such. So further detailed control over the movement of the tool in this otherwise automatic toolpath. Now, even though this is a 3D recognition toolpath, you still can give it the ability to do gouge checking, just similar, again, to what we saw in the HSS video. So for more detail on this particular section, I'll refer you to the HSS introductory video in this series. And then lastly, transformation. This particular 3D toolpath, we can either translate, rotate in a particular era, area. If we click on here, we can see that we have the ability to rotate or translate it. Or mirror, we can mirror about a particular 
plane, and then we can copy that tool path to other sections or other parts. So that is Turbo HSR Hatch. And if we take a look at that toolpath, we'll see that it is actually just the toolpath that moves back and forth across the part in a particular direction. So as you can see, this toolpath moves in a zigzag pattern across the part. And since I set this to regions, it actually is localizing the movements of the tool. So hatch is just basically just uh, one direction movement around the part. And you can see that also there are differences in the ramping strategies as, as it looks at the different part in different areas. So similar controls exist for all the different strategies. Let's just go through the details of each strategy. So again, in Turbo HSR Contour, you can see that we use the target as our geometry. We also have stock control, fixture control, and pre-drilled uh, holes. Uh, essentially, all of this is the same. In the passive section, you can see very similar controls. So all you're really doing here with the contour is you're giving it a contour style toolpath. So if we take a look at that in wireframe, We're getting more of a contour style, racetrack style. So you can see with each step over, it actually is following the contours of the part of those bosses rather than moving in one direction. So depending on the quality of your rough or the material, you're looking for different strategies here around your part. Really, it's more detailed on the geometry that you're trying to machine. In this case, I would probably use contour because there's a lot more of curvature in this part than there is a singular direction that would make sense for roughing. Now, let's say I suppress the first pull path because we're about to use the REST technology, and REST is going to look at that remaining stock. Now, the detail with REST is that it automatically wants to look at that updated stock. So once we open this up, we'll see that it actually already has the respect stock model predefined, and that makes this a REST operation uh, automatically. Now. The, the difference between this and just turning on the updated stock definition is later on when we get to the passes section. Uh, I'm sorry, not passes section, the reference tool is that there's a new option here to tell it what the previous tool size was. So we still get the ability to tell it to look at the target with particular offsets. The stock has their respect auto, uh, automatic updated stock already turned on. So you could do this with other options as well pretty much turning it into a REST operation because it's looking at that updated stock. But what this is gonna do is look at the updated stock, what the previous tool did, and then generate a toolpath based off of what the previous tool did not do or could not do. So the REST option gives you this additional section here where you can actually take a look at what the previous tool would not have done. So let's actually take a look at that with the calculation. that is checking the model for what the previous tool size had done, what the previous stock looks like. It will generate a tool path where this particular tool, in this case a quarter inch tool, is going to take over for the half inch tool. So after analyzing the part for what the previous tool did, what the stock looks like, it is now calculating the rest operation on its own. So with that toolpath fully calculated, you can see that it applies the same roughing strategy, the same roughing rules we applied, but with this smaller diameter tool, to the areas remaining from the previous toolpath. Any questions of this or anything else from Solicam, just give us a call at 1-866-975-1115, extension 2, and stay tuned for the rest of the videos in this introductory series. Thanks for watching.